Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fiber Broadband Association's Fiber for Breakfast. We're now in our 21st episode of 2023. But before I kick off, I'd like to thank Wesco, the platinum sponsor of Fiber Breakfast, and our gold sponsor, Graybar. You know, a lot is going on in D.C. On Monday, President Biden announced he's going to nominate Anna Gomez for the fifth and open FCC commissioner seat. Gomez is currently a senior advisor at the State Department, working on telecom, and was formerly at NTIA and at the FCC, and one, a one-time uh, Wiley Rain partner. Also, uh, FCC commissioners Stark and Carr were renominated. Also yesterday, the Energy House and Commerce Committee held a communications and technology legislative hearing on the oversight and reauthorize, reauthorization of NTIA. So, of course, Alan Davidson, the administration for NTIA, testified and defended that NTIA is following the IIJA statute as it relates to BEAD, NOFO, and the technology preference. He also mentioned that they're considering BEAD waivers for Buy America, but really needs to understand where there are major issues. And lastly, emphasize efforts to coordinate with other agencies on federal lands, such as permitting. And then today, Energy and um, uh, the House Energy and Commerce Committee will hold a markup session, uh, include legislation to address uh, broadband permitting. So again, something we've been really focused on. And last week, you know, the Fiber Broadband Association, we were in Austin for our regional Fiber Connect workshop. And then following on Wednesday, following our event, Marisa and our members from the Public Policy Committee held a morning session with the uh, Texas legislature at the Capitol. And on Friday, we were absolutely thrilled to see the Texas legislature pass legislation requiring the Texas Broadband Office to prioritize fiber for the state broadband funding projects. Uh, this is a huge victory for the citizens of Texas. And as you guys may know, Texas will be the largest recipient of BEAD funding. I was thinking about $3 billion. Um, their broadband office is kind of thinking $4 billion, but they're going to get a lot of money. So it's great to see that it's going to be all fiber. Our next regional Fiber Connect workshop will be in Lake Tahoe in California on June 21st. You know, we hope to see you at the beautiful Squaw Valley Resort for this important educational event. And also, registration is open for Fiber Connect 23 in Orlando, August 20 to 23rd. So we just opened up registration, I guess, a week ago or so, and we've had the quickest um, level of signups than we've ever had at any conference. So this is going to be the biggest and best fiber broadband event in the world this year with over 4,000 attendees and an amazing program. Um, this also brings us to today's Fiber Breakfast session with Mike O'Day, the Chief Technology Officer for Corning Optical Communications, to discuss planning the future of fiber networks, 4S design considerations. But before I formally introduce today's guests, I'd like to introduce Trish Ehlers from my team, who's going to walk us through some housekeeping items. Thanks, Gary, and good morning to everyone who's joined us today. Before I go over a few logistical items, we'd like to once again thank the platinum sponsor of Fiber for Breakfast, Westco, and our gold sponsor, Gray Bar. Now, if everyone would please keep in mind that you're all in listen mode only. To ask a question, you can type it into the question panel in the right side of your screen. We'll host a Q&A session with uh, Mike at the end of today's session. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on FBA's website within 24 to 48 hours. You can find the recording in the events tab under the Fiber for Breakfast drop-down option. At the conclusion of today's presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a very brief feedback survey. Please take a minute to do that. We really appreciate your input. I'll pass it to Gary now to introduce our panelists and get us started. Gary. Thanks, Trish, and good morning. I'm Gary Bolton, President and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association. You know, last week on Fiber Breakfast, we heard from Sally Doty, the Mississippi State Broadband Director, and Quinn Jordan, the Mississippi Broadband Association, as we discussed turning the tide in Mississippi with fiber. You know, Mississippi got off to a late start with their broadband office, but Sally and Quinn have teamed together to accelerate fiber deployment in Mississippi. Today on Fiber for Breakfast, we have the pleasure of hearing from Michael Day, the Chief Technology Officer for Corning Optical Communications, to discuss planning the future of fiber networks for S design considerations. Uh, Mike is the Chief Technology Officer for Corning, 
Mike's um, responsible for leading the disruptive innovation programs and adoption by customers while aligning the optical fiber, cable, and connectivity R&D organizations to deliver innovations required by growth or for growth. Uh, Mike joined the Corning family upon leaving the U.S. Army in 1998. So, Mike, thank you for your service. And most of his career has been spent managing Corning's optical connectivity products, helping launch fiber to the home products in support of Verizon's Fios initiative. Uh, and Mike hails from northern Missouri. He received his undergraduate degree from the West Point, U.S. Um, Military Academy and his master's from Minnesota State University. And he spent seven years active duty as a field artillery officer, primarily in the 4th Infantry Division and the 29th Artillery Regiment, participating in training peacekeeping operations after the Persian Gulf War in 1991. So again, welcome Mike. And for audience, please type in your questions as go and we'll work them into the Q&A at the end. So I'll turn things over to Mike. Okay, thank you, Gary, for your introduction, and and we are grateful on behalf of Corning for this invitation, and all the all of us at Corning appreciate our longstanding partnership with the Fiber Broadband Association. So we can go to the next slide. I thought I would just start with a very brief uh, overview of Corning and our background. We've been ar uh, around for over 170 years, pioneers of glass science, ceramic science, and optical physics, and the the theme of today's uh, discussion will be around innovation, and that's one of our seven core values and how we like to innovate around uh, close with close co uh, collaboration with our customers to solve tough technology challenges. Next slide. I'm part of the optical communications division within Corning, and our, this is our headquarters building. It's located actually in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, we have, over the last several decades, since I've worked with Corning 25 years ago, has uh, developed many breakthrough innovations that have steadily moved our industry forward, uh, starting with low-loss optical fiber nearly 50 years ago, or more than 50 years ago, and then up through our latest innovations in continuing in fiber and cable and connectivity uh, throughout this time. So if you go to slide, uh, the next slide, You'll find Corning in nearly every segment of the telecommunications network. We serve carrier networks that bring high-speed connectivity to people in more places, serving data centers that support uh, today's data-rich applications, enterprises like hospitals, universities, um, and hotels that turn to us for fiber ar architectures that deliver uh, seamless connectivity throughout their buildings. And lastly, to the OEM segment, micro-optic optic connectivity solutions uh, for the OEMs. That's a business that we serve from a, from a Corning perspective, and you'll find fiber reaching into all of these application segments. Next slide. So just to elaborate briefly on what's happening in each of these four, because it really forms the basis of Corning as well as the industry's innovation pipeline. I'll start with the carrier networks. Um, um, broadband is happening, and um, it's you know connectivity is increasingly seen as essential infrastructure, just like or much like electricity. And so, like you, we at Corning are super excited to see the current wave of public investment in broadband networks, such as the BEAD program, the $42 billion BEAD program, uh, recognizing that making internet for all a reality. Uh, which will be a tremendous undertaking uh, in the U.S. And currently, as many of you probably know, only 19% um, of, of citizens in the U.S. are connected to fiber, to a fiber network today. The second one in the cloud space, uh, when, you, when you connect more customers, essentially what's happening is consumers need to hook up these high-speed broad, high broadband networks. Uh, they are going to consume more videos and access more information through the through the cloud. And as a result, um, our, our data center customers are really expanding as, as rapidly as they can to keep pace with what's happening in the in the broadband side of the network. On the enterprise side, we, we talk about fiber deep, but um, one thing I would just note um, that enterprises need to support a workforce today that's partly remote and partly on site with seamless 
connectivity, with a seamless connectivity experience. Um, when we talk about horizontal only in the 5% of the reach with fiber, there's a lot of work to do because it's still largely a copper ba based network. You have fiber in the backbone, um, but how do you continue to drive fiber deeper into the network to enable you know, future technologies like 5G and Wi-Fi 7 and what's beyond inside of a building to ensure that seamless connectivity. And lastly, the OEM space uh, where we're seeing exciting opportunities uh, for innovation through co-packaged optics where we will extend optical connectivity, you know, all the way to the chip, which allows operators to boost performance, uh, but as importantly, reducing power consumption in data centers, uh, for example. So those are the mega trends that we see happening, and that is what guides uh, Corning's innovation pipeline in these various telecom segments. The next slide. So Gary mentioned the 4S model, and, and I'll explain briefly what each of those are and, and provide a, a few details as to what we're doing on the innovation side. Uh, you know, foremost, our industry, uh, we are at uh, an exciting moment in time to connect the unconnected um, and deliver access to really many life-changing applications, and fiber networks are at the center of it all. Um, but meeting this uh, this opportunity in time calls for a new commitment to innovation from, from companies like Corning um, for our entire industry ecosystem in four areas, four key areas, what I call the 4S model. Speed, you see, which is really building broadband networks and data center uh, scaling have to build faster uh, to stay ahead of the surging bandwidth and meet the re required timelines, frankly, for uh, for government supported projects. Uh, size, you know, space is increasingly at a premium, whether in the field, central office, or a spine to, to leaf link inside of a data center. And so we have to maximize the physical real estate that's available uh, with as dense of solutions as possible. On simplicity, it's really around uh, we recognize that skilled labor is, is in the in the field actually remains quite scarce. And so operators have to uh, figure out ways to use new solutions to help them scale with fewer resources and minimizing errors. And lastly, sustainability, which is really around uh, developing solutions that uh, have a reduced carbon footprint so that uh, we can help our customers meet their aggressive environmental targets and build a more sustainable world. So let me unpack each of those just briefly in a few slides. If you go to the next one, I'll start with speed, the first S, and this is really about how do you deploy a network faster. Um, it's critical for many many reasons uh, to stay ahead of, of bandwidth demands, meet aggressive timelines that are required to you know for government funded deployments, um, and to make sure your deployments, uh, customer deployments, are as cost effective as possible. And so for decades, we focused on innovation to help customers deploy their, their networks faster. And for example, what you see on the right is our one of our most recent innovations launched a couple of years ago uh, called the Evolve solution uh, with push lock connectors. And they're fast, easy to install. You just simply uh, push, click, and connect. And now you've you've accessed and activated a line to, to a consumer. And what we have found over the course of time is that these solutions have proven to speed the install of fiber to the home networks in half the time versus traditional splice networks. And that's a significant point that I would reemphasize half the time. So if it takes you six months to deploy, we can, what we have seen is, is it will uh, cut that in half. And uh, to give you some, some maybe some credibility, credibility to the pre-con solutions and speed, uh, we've now recently celebrated a milestone at Corning where we have passed over the past really two decades almost 100 million homes around the world have uh, pre-connectorized solutions and it's all built around the value prop of speed getting networks deployed faster which in turn then allows you to uh, set, you know turn on services to customers much more quickly if you go to the next slide uh, let's talk about space um, a really size, I'm sorry, I, I mentioned space, but if we talk about size, um, what we are, you know, space is increasingly at a premium. Our pathways congested and denser solutions are in fact um, needed. And so um, one of our new, one of our innovations, if I unpack them from the top to bottom on the right, 
um, a new fiber called contour fiber, an SMF28 fiber, single mode fiber, a 190 micron fiber that enables smaller cables. And so important because it now lets operators maximize uh, the use of existing um, of an existing e ecosystem, but also shrinking this, the footprint of the fiber uh, fiber network system. Data centers are maximizing fiber pathways uh, with flexible ribbon uh, mini extend cable, and that's a 200 micron ribbon technology. Um, and what that allows uh, operators to do, whether it's in a data center or in a carrier network, but um, you can get more fibers now in a duct and duct space is increasingly constricted, uh, crowded. And so the more fibers you can put in a finite amount of space um, is better for, uh, for all of our customers. And lastly, on the connectivity side, I mentioned the Evolve platform. You can see the terminal there. Um, essentially what we did is take the connector, if you're familiar with the OptiTap connector or hardened connectivity, uh, that connector is the size of a broomstick handle is, a, is a, a way to think about it. The new connector is the size of a pencil. And so you can imagine when you shrink the space by over 50%, uh, it allows you to do many new things for space in a handhold on a facade um, in a data center is, is constricted. Uh, we, are, we are working to develop solutions to take advantage of, of space constraints. The next one, um, if you go to the next slide around simplicity, um, you know, our, our, our industry is, is and will continue to struggle with the scarcity of skilled labor. And that's why pre-connectorized solutions that I mentioned earlier have had such a, uh, a big success. And we haven't stopped uh, since the, you know, since the beginning of Fiber to the Home in 2004 in a, in a significant way, innovating around this. And so um, what we're trying to do is simply reduce the dependency on field labor. Um, and what we do when we do that, um, what happens is our, we see safety benefits, benefits in the field. People are not on ladders or poles nearly as, as long uh, throughout the installation of a network. Um, what we're also seeing is, you know, for every splice that's done in a factory, um, it's tested and the connector is sealed to enable a plug and play experience. And so we reduce rework and testing and troubleshooting in the field as well. And so it just makes the network simpler and easier to uh, to deploy. If we go to the last S, uh, the next slide around sustainability, and you know everything that we do uh, are doing at Corning is really with this in mind, and it starts with the innovation. If you can conceive a new product uh, that's greener and, um, and leads to a, a lower carbon footprint, uh, we are trying to do that. And then we have a couple of examples. You'll see a picture on the screen about a cable that's you know, over 50% smaller with the same number of fibers in a cable. And, you know, and you really don't give up much when you actually have to use and handle that cable uh, to splice it or, or to terminate that, that cable. And so, um, so what we're doing we, on our invent side, we're, we're embedding uh, design rules in place to really take advantage of how do we design things with a lower carbon footprint, both the product as well as in our manufacturing system. How do we reduce the greenhouse gases, water, waste, energy in our operations. Uh, one notable highlight for, for cable folks, um, in 2022, for instance, we, we implemented a real wooden reel, cable reel return program. And this program uh, saved the equivalent of about 12,000 trees alone uh, last year. And so it's sort of interesting to see, but uh, there are so many untapped uh, areas that we can explore and exploit to figure out how to uh, build a world that's uh, a little bit more sustainable. And so that's what we're doing. And you'll see some of our goals, what we're doing, try to reduce scope one and two emissions by 30% by 2028 and scope three as well. Okay, next slide. I want, I want to just touch on briefly before I close on, on the rural deployment and the opportunity. And so um, we, we are super excited by the work that Gary, you and Fiber Broadband Association have done and participated in. And I think for everybody on this call, we, we look forward to the day when every uh, US citizen is connected with real broadband connectivity uh, because it will unleash the potential of what this country and what our citizens are capable of. And so we are at Corning proud and delighted to be a part of it and, and trying to do our part, frankly, uh, through innovation and products to help networks be deployed faster, cheaper, more simply, um, but 
also in the form of capacity, and I'll touch on this briefly. Um, but since 2020, we've embarked upon a, a significant capital campaign within Corning, uh, you know, delivering or totaling over $500 million of fiber and cable, domestic fiber and cable capacity in the U.S. Um, across the country, largely in North Carolina, but in other regions of the of the country as well. So that as as the funding, government stimulus funding takes place starting next year, I uh, want to assure any customer on the line that we are ready. We formed a couple of commercial partnerships with NTCAA that you might be familiar with. And so, um, so we are ready and trying to do our part to be ready to enable this wonderful opportunity that, uh, that sits before us all. Okay, um, I'll close with uh, the last slide, uh, which is really you know, delivering on the promise of ubiqu ubiquitous broadband uh, to all, which requires new waves of innovation across fiber, cable, connectivity, and the entire suite of products and uh, and ecosystem. Um, I hope you find the 4S framework useful um, in thinking about how Corning is thinking about anything that we are designing, a new product, a new development, needs to touch on one, if not all of those S's, uh, because those are what's important to getting a broadband network deployed, uh, cheaply, faster, um, and more sustainably. And so, um, but we need innovative thinking, not just in the labs, but in the manufacturing and commercial areas as well. And I think you'll see, you know, over the course of time, a new wave of innovation that will require kind of a sustained commitment from this ecosystem, operators, standards bodies, installers, and equipment manufacturers like Corning. And so we're going to be with everybody on this call, on this journey uh, to expand the bandwidth of human potential. And so I'll go to my last slide and just close with that and turn it over to Gary for the Q&A. But I just want to say thank you, uh, Gary, and to Fiber Broadband Association once again for allowing me to, to be with you today. And we can turn on to the, the Q&A. Well, Mike, this is great stuff. And you know, really appreciate all the amazing innovation that you and Corning are doing. So one of the questions I always get asked, you know, and it's very confusing for legislatures, uh, is how long does fiber last? You know, we've, it's been in the ground since the 80s, but yeah. how can people think about this? Is this? Yeah. Well, um, you know, fortunately, perhaps we don't actually know how long it can last because some of the first fibers that have been put in the ground um, in the 70s and 80s are still in operation today. We had a had a customer of ours uh, that shared this this uh, point. We they are running you know modern coherent transmission systems today over a portion of their metro and long haul network with fiber that was installed prior to 1986. And those came from a customer, a big customer of ours that's, that's been deploying fiber for you know for a number of years, and so it's performing well now. What I would say through all of our testing and aging testing that we've done in our own labs, um, you know, if the cable was installed and operated properly, meaning it wasn't installed under stress and there's not water ingress or there's a, a leak in the cable, we actually actually haven't found when uh, the the longevity of fiber actually uh, you know ends. And so so we're excited about that, and we want to you know if we can help dispel any myths that fiber only lasts a certain period of time. Uh, what we can assure you is it lasts a long time, um, you know, and we wouldn't put a year on that because we actually haven't found it if it's installed in the right conditions. Okay, so fiber lasts for decades and decades. Um, so one of the other uh, things that keeps coming up is speed, you know, like even yesterday on the Hill, you uh -huh. know, people are arguing, oh, well, you know, rural America doesn't even need 100 by 20. And, you know, so we're seeing, 10 gig networks going today, now 25 gig networks, and you know, Nokia's you know was demonstrating at our conference 100 gig pond. So what what can we think of like speed? What do we should we anticipate? Where's the speed going? Yeah. Let, maybe let me answer that through what's what's possible on a fiber. Um as because as the speeds change and you mentioned the hundred uh down 120, one one hundred and twenty. Uh, in legislation to require the requirement for a real broadband network, but um, the fiber, uh, the fiber, you don't have to worry. Um, you know, the the high end or the data throughput of fiber for for traditional fibers, and uh, and we have to be clear on this because there are some, you know, different fiber types and some hero work that demonstrates some really 
you know, tremendous speeds, but for a single core, single mode fiber, which is what traditionally is deployed in the long haul metro and access networks, um, we see we see the fiber being capable of, of at least 250 terabits per second. And so far exceeding uh, the speed you just mentioned, uh, and that's just on a single core, single mode fiber. And so now there are other, can it, can it exceed that? Yes. You know, if we talk about multi-core fibers or uh, other technologies that are being worked on and interesting, maybe for some niche or some unique applications, submarine, for instance, uh, you might see data rates that even go higher. Um, however, let me just tell you that, uh, you know, the, the capability of a single mode optical fiber uh, far exceeds uh, the speeds that we see, you know, really for the foreseeable future in an access network. Yeah, so we can anticipate that even today we can think of hundreds of terabits and it, it shouldn't be a problem for the fiber that's been deployed. For what, what has been deployed and continues to be deployed, you won't have to upgrade or replace your plant because, uh, because the speeds needed at the residence or at the business uh, will not exceed what's capable in a single mode fiber. And, you know, so we had Telab come in and tell a lot of state legislatures that, well, the fiber in there today is going to be pulled out in the next couple of years because, you know, we're going to go to multi-mode or something um, or some other technology advancements in fiber. But when we were talking yesterday, you know, you're saying with a 250 micron fiber, it's going to be shrunk to 200 micron. But even as we move those innovations, those fibers will be compatible, right? You'll be able to splice those together. And That's right. Yeah, we, we're working on, I mentioned contour fiber. It's a 200 micron uh, fiber. Most of, most of the deployed fiber today is a 250 micron uh, fiber base. But, uh, but there are ways you can, uh, that are backward compatible, that you can splice, for instance, a 200 micron ribbon or loose tube uh, cable design with a 250 micron uh, installed base if you need it. And, and of course, 200 to 200, uh, absolutely no problem, but it'll require a little bit of extra work when you splice it together. Uh, but there is no issue of uh, obsoleting any of your plant because you move to a different, to the 200 micron fiber type is not actually true. That's not not needed, not the case. Uh, it does work and, and we will ensure that does in fact happen. And you know you have to measure, measure the benefit. Uh, do you mix your plant, and it might take an extra few minutes to splice 12 fibers, uh, 200 to 250, on the on the fiber size. However, um, the benefit of 200 allows you to put a lot more fibers in spaces. And so I think customers and operators are going to want to do that over the course of time. All right. So quickly, one of the things you know you interview your innovations are about you know having pre-engineered fiber cables and being able to then have these connectorized and so forth so i get all these questions like how much slack loop do you need i mean so when you're doing pre-connectorized yeah. cables how accurate do they need to be and you know is that easy to deploy and do they have to worry about yeah. it's a great question uh, because there's a there's a myth or a barrier out there that uh, is 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 right and natural to ask if I pre-engineer it, if I don't get it right, what happens? And we tell you, we pass now uh, with our FlexSnap technology, which is pre-engineered in the factory, we take a measurement from the customer in the field, build the cable uh, exactly right and ship it and it gets installed in almost no time. Um, you know, being accurate, it, it's helpful. The more accurate you are, but I would just tell you, you don't have to be precise. We build and have mechanisms in place to ensure that if you're off by 10 feet or 50 feet or 100 feet, uh, we have lots of ways. There's not a deployment scenario that we haven't encountered that we can't figure out how to use that cable and make it work. Um, but generally, um, it's not a lot different than what an operator would do today when they go out and decide and measure those same measurements. If we have that, then we can pre-engineer it. And you know, 99.9 percent, .9%, this is about right, of the cables that we've made in our factory, the pre-engineered have worked. And so just to give you some confidence in the ability to, to do this, to design it, that we can overcome that barrier uh, quite easily. And we've proven that with over so, 50 million homes passed through the technology. So if you look for performance, speed of deployment, and having less skilled 
um, installate installers, that's the way you go engineered fiber. That is what that is what we would tell you. You'll save money, speed, and uh, and your real your network is going to be done uh, and installed in a much more reliable way. All right, just two quick questions here, and I'll add these together. But um, they came from the same person. But one is um, on growth. You know, I think last year, you know, we certainly saw a lot of fiber growth. And um, do you guys have a feel on what you've seen that growth will be? And then the other was on climate change and so forth. Do you see more tendency towards buried or aerial? Uh huh. Um, okay, I'll start on the on the growth, and I'll be brief. I know we're at the end of time, but on the on growth. Um, we we would view what we are doing right now. We're in a, a multi-year growth cycle uh, that lasts, you know, we think the better part of this decade and well into well into the next. Uh, um, just given the the macro trends that we see both in the broadband network and the cloud data centers driving that growth. And so, however, it's not linear. And you know, we, right now we're seeing a, a little bit of a contraction this year um, for for a number of reasons, whether it's an inventory hangover or just uncertainty in the global economy, uh, what's happening, that uh, operators are scaling back their plans this year. Um, but we expect growth in, uh, over the long term. And our CFO just spoke yesterday. And so you can you can see what Corning thinks publicly, what we shared with our investors yesterday. Uh, but the fundamentals of optical growth uh, remain super strong for uh, for many years to come. Now, aerial versus buried. I would say, I don't know if I know the answer to that uh, completely. We see a mix. We have seen a mix uh, over the years. Maybe we've we've deployed more aerial than buried in the networks that we've installed or been a part of an installation with an operator historically. And I think that is moving more from aerial to buried simply because aerial is a little faster and cheaper to get, get deployed uh, than a buried network. And so I think we might see more buried uh, over the next decade to pass the homes that require a barrier network than buried. I think more homes probably sit out there that haven't been connected uh, that, that would require a buried plant would be my uh, my sense, what I believe. Well, Mike, really appreciate it. You know, I always love talking to the guy, the chief technology officer <laughs> at the largest fiber manufacturer. So thank you very much. I really appreciate what you and Corning are doing to really advance fiber optic technology. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today and look forward to getting together next Wednesday where our guest says Ofer Schwartz, the founder and CEO of Capcom Networks, who's going to discuss rural broadband operators, um, internet exchanges, peering, and the user experience. So you're not going to want to miss that. So thanks again, Mike, and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Gary. Take care.